Leaders need a team and a team needs a leader. That's obvious, but it's not always easy to achieve a consistent, harmonious and winning team. My guest today knows a lot about creating and leading winning teams and the pressures at the top. He's a former professional football manager, business leader, and now founder of the Leaders Advisory Service. Welcome, Tony Walmsley. Malcolm, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you today. Oh, great to meet you, Tony. Tony, we all know that biz- the business world is in constant change. Uh, have leaders got to change their skills accordingly? What does a successful leader of today look like and do? Well, I think I think change is, is the key word there. Uh, leaders need to be in a constant state of evolution themselves. Uh, you know, I guess one of the core principles of, of, of the calm leadership framework, learning, it sort of relates to that in the context of personal growth, uh, growing a deeper understanding of how to connect with others. So it's, it's a continual curve. You know, the leader today has got a high level of self-awareness, got an ability to create an optimum working environment, and that has to align with the strengths of each member we, we, of the team, which is, which is complex. And ultimately, it takes responsibility. So today's leader's got to be responsible for all of the performance that, that he, she, or the team um, produces, which mm. takes a bit of courage as well. Yeah, responsibility does take courage, isn't it? Easy people to duck, duck out of it. Look, I said in my opening piece that leaders and teams need each other. In your experience, where does cohesion and harmony usually fall down? Is it lack of communication, vision, civility? What? Well, this, you know, it's a bottomless pit, really, isn't it? I, I think the best teams, firstly, without doubt, are diverse. There's a, there's a constant tension. In an optimal team, there's a constant tension with multiple personas who are not necessarily naturally aligned or have got a natural disposition. Um, and they need to be free to offer perspective, unique perspective without judgment is, is the first thing I would say. And when, when that's out of balance, you know, something's underrepresented or there's a dominance of one type over another, I would say there's, there's suboptimal performances ensues in that context. And if you think about it from a business culture point of view, um, I use, a, you know, if we think about collaboration, think about recognition, empowerment, appreciation, trust is a big one, expectation. If any of those elements are unattended at any time, there's a deficit in, in, in performance. So it, it's sort of a simple framework and a simple philosophy, um, but it's not tackled consistently enough. And the managers of teams have got the most complex challenge and it doesn't need to be that difficult to overcome it, but it is an untapped uh, source of competitive advantage, I think. Yes, good. Now, let me talk about your um, previous life. You know, I suggest that one of the most high pressure jobs is being a football manager. It almost seems like a manager is there to be kicked around by anyone from chairman to player. How do the successful, like Sir Alex Ferguson, stand out, not only achieve longevity, but also winning results? Wow, I mean, I mean, Sir Alex is, is an outlier, you know, tr- he's truly unique. I think taking lessons from the teachings that people, uh, that the real top of their game uh, can offer is a wise thing to do. But I think it's a mistake to compare yourself um, to, to people who are so far, you know, ahead of the pack. I think falling short would be likely most of the time. I don't think that's a healthy position for anyone to be in. So I think the first thing to do is to define what winning is in context. And I think the lessons around that, certainly for me, are it's understanding who you are. So how do you become great using your own natural gifts so that who you become and who you who you're moving towards becoming is part of any success that you do? So, if, you know, in football, the classically people get recognized for being good at football um, and then when the career's over they sometimes fall off the edge because they can't identify with with anything else and I think there's there's a great lesson in that um, right now people want to know how much you care they're not interested in how good you are at what you do they're interested in how you how good you are at, at being who you are and that's about caring for, for people on their terms very important. Mm. I, I like that um, 
comment you made that, you know, don't think you can be the next Sir Alex you know, because too many books are around, you know, be the next Sir Richard Branson and things like that. You know, learn from them, but don't try and emulate. What is it that... I, I the sorry, yeah. Mark, I was, I was yeah, just going to say that everybody's got unique gifts and, you know, Fergie was brilliant at, at getting the best out of people. And, you know, hearts and minds are one when, when the leader is able to recognise what each person brings to the table and enables them to flourish. And if you can do that, you've 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 got the you've got the dressing room, I guess. Yeah, great, great, Tony. Now, what is it that the leaders' advisories uh, does for businesses, and and what are you seeing as the biggest demand at the moment? I mean, the the current state has put unique demands on 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 the workplace. Um, at, at the leaders' advisory, we tackle we tackle performance in the context of each individual. So we co-create a solution based on what good performance looks like for you. Um, and ultimately it's tackling things like disengagement. So employee engagement, uh, productivity and mental health. They're all massive global issues that's being experienced in the workplace. Um, we want leaders to be mature and decisive, ultimately take responsibility. We've touched on that. We've touched on courage. And sometimes, and, and now is a great example of doing that under extraordinary pressure and when people are under pressure um, they naturally fall back to their default position and sometimes that can mean getting squeezed into behaviors that are not conducive to healthy pursuits and and, and good performance ultimately so I, I would say there's three main areas to this one is uh, so in terms of the the companies that I'm talking to there's downsizing organizations people are losing headcount the changes so in a constant change now of transformation, new teams getting deployed, new managers in place, and all hell cuts loose. Um, there's there's growth. So there's come there's businesses like the tech sector. I came out of the tech sector just over well two years ago now. Um, you know, incredibly good at scaling quickly, which puts a high demand on people to meet that con continuous. Uh, continuous change and it's about ultimately uncertainty you know healthcare would be another example of a different level of pressure um the the demands in some healthcare sectors have just gone through the roof and how people cope with that extra demand um is you know a really big challenge and we're, we're talking about uncertainty uh, it's too easy to measure output and blame people for for jobs not getting done um I think the more mature approach is to just 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 make sure um, people are coping and people are understand that you know what they're going through at the moment. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that one. Definitely, coping is an uh, important aspect. In, in my mind, I want to be on a winning team, not just mid table. What does a winning team though look like? What are its, are its characteristics from, say, an average team? Yeah, that's a great question. It's um, something around value here. I think I think for each stakeholder in the game, there's a different value at play. And again, it's about individual differences. That puts tremendous pressure on leaders that they have to have the adaptability to recognise it. They've got to accept it. They've got to respect it. They've got to. Everybody's different. And, and you need to dispel the myth that a certain type of manager is the best manager or that certain types of people are not team players. So if you can get past that and recognise that everybody's unique, that's a good place to start. The majority of people quit and cite the manager as being the reason why. So there's something there, there's a known problem um, that I believe is the greatest untapped competitive advantage that are within the walls of any business right now. So it starts understanding what success looks like, clearly define it, and then aligning the work that people do to their innate natural gifts or natural strengths. Yeah, and then it's about help, helping the manager um, to recognise that it's their responsibility to bridge that gap first. So I, I'm the manager. I'm responsible. I move towards you. I don't just say we're going this way. You guys follow me. It, it, it's fraught with peril if that's the the only approach that you've got in your kit bag. 
Mm, I, I like that flow. Very simple, very easy to understand. Um, now, I know you're a great believer in psychographic profiling. How does it work for you and your clients? And oh, so, can it sometimes be error prone? Yeah, it, it 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 can be a complete waste of time. Is is the honest truth? And for me, it's using data and technology to underpin your approach is important when, when you can get a benefit out of it. So then it becomes important to recognize, well, what data is actually useful? And in the context of leadership development, what data can drive or help support positive change? So I had to work out, okay, what would a profiling tool give me if it was world-class? What does world-class profiling look like? I did a lot of research into that. Uh, so what, what can underpin deep self-awareness? What can under what can bring team uh, challenges to the surface that businesses can act on? And it's a competitive marketplace. You've got Myers-Briggs, you've got DISC, you've got Insights, you've got the big five, you've got 16 personalities. There's loads of stuff out there, um, but not every not everything's what it says it is on the tin. So for me, it needed to be highly accurate and high resolution. So we might, instead of being labeled or being put in a box, no, that doesn't work for me. There's 7 billion people on the planet and everybody's got something unique to offer. So let's dispel that myth. And then it's interpretation. So I wanted a report that was so detailed um, that it became more of an application than just a piece of information that you read once and stick in the bottom drawer. And then around that, obviously, to make it accessible, affordable, um, we, we've managed to tick all those boxes. And, and I'm you know, fortunate that I've been able to find somebody, uh, people maps who, who've helped me develop outstanding uh, tools to underpin what I'm doing. Excellent, excellent. Uh, look, I'm intrigued. On your website, and viewers don't forget behind me is Tony's URL, on the website, you ask a question. In the moments that matter most, who do you want to be? What do you mean by that question? And how do you then help people? I think the underlying message behind the question is, and I think I've touched on it already, it's about who you're being rather than what is it that you're doing well. Um, as a coach, you might, my role is to help people make better choices towards potential. It's a future-focused vision, helping people see what's possible for them, uh, which is really about fulfillment. So when you know your purpose, every decision that you make carries more weight. You know, what's a, what, I'm interested in what their vision for the future looks like. Who are they doing it for? You know, within that process, you can find sort of more values-based answers that define who you are and who you want to become. So I think for individuals, sometimes we use a football analogy before, but imagine a CEO that's been in a job for, for, for 20 years and has been really successful. There, there are many encounters that I have with people who've reached the point where what they used to do doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work for them. And, and they talk about this fulfillment, there's something missing. They don't want for anything. They don't need anything. They're, 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 they've made it financially, but they're a little bit lost. And, you know, if they're leading an organization, it's not a great state to be turning up in. So it's being able to help with that. Mm, excellent. Uh, let's do, do stay with sport because I think it's so important. Uh, you've worked in sport in many roles in many countries. What have you learned during that career about winning? I think I think winning's subjective to a degree. It's different for everyone, and mostly it's out of your control. You know, you, there's many contributors to performance, and along the way towards trying to win, um, there are people that help and people that hinder those objectives. Then you think about well, there's only there's only one winner. Everybody else is some way short of that, either second or, or last, however you want to measure it. And if that's the only, if winning is the only success measure that you've got, I think it's a fragile way to, to exist. And I think the power lies in who you do it for, who you do it with, and connecting people to the mission becomes the success. 
and success follows connecting people to the mission. So I think, you know, define what winning looks like, define what good looks like, um, and getting towards goals and objectives um, with meaning and purpose is the way to be fulfilled and to be successful in the moment. And that's, that's important to be doing it when you're doing it. Mm, excellent. Yes. Uh, Tony, I like to give all my guests three wishes. How would you use your three wishes to help my viewers and listeners be better leaders in this new world, new society that we all now face? I'd focus on three self-management checks. My, my, uh, my vision is, is, is stronger people. So, so the first would be be responsible for everything that happens today. And, and around that is who, who do I need to help me to achieve that? Then you can be grateful for that support as you, as you go. And I've got an interest in well, I was playing with the, with the word virus, which is quite topical. <laughs> and and it's, I use it because it's easily remembered, certainly in, in the climate that we're in now. And it, it's about ensuring that your people feel valued, included, respected, understood and safe. It's uncertain times and they're great messages to take away. And finally, check yourself. So if, if I do this, if I take this decision, does it align with who I want to become? And if it does, have the courage to do it. Okay. Just before we, we finish, Tony, just do virus again. So, so virus um, is about how you make your people feel valued, included, respected, understood, safe. Tony Walmsley, when I watch the news tonight, I'll be seeing COVID in a different light. Thank you for a brilliant interview. Thanks very much, Malcolm.